Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to our service of worship this morning here at the First Congregational Church. We are happy to know that many of you are still watching on WBAC at 2 o'clock now or on the internet. My name is Cheryl Mungin, and I am the worship leader today. I will also be reading the scriptures. We are pleased, as always, to have Charles Machuku as our organist. Our minister is Pastor George Cole, and our service is being recorded today by Christy and Tom Stilla. The flowers on the altar are in loving memory of Dan and Ida Adams and Cheryl Morrill and George Adams, given by Gigi Zip. At this time, if you need to communicate anything or need assistance, please call Pastor Cole or the church office at 508-869-2027 or use one of the cards in the pews and leave it in the collection plate by the door. If you need food, the food pantry is open from 10 to 12 every Monday. If you need food supplies on another day, call the church for assistance. If you need someone to go out and run an errand for you so you don't have to take the risk, we have a list of healthy young people who will do that. Please call the church, Michelle Simler, or Pastor Cole. During this time of online worship, please remember to send in your pledges by mail if you do not feel comfortable coming to church. The church needs your continued support to meet its expenses. If you have a prayer request or a note of praise to share, send it to Pastor Cole by Friday evening. Make sure you specify whether it is just for church leadership to pray or if it is something or someone we can pray for during our broadcast. We still want to show care for one another during this difficult time. Please remember to take your lilies home today so that you can enjoy them. Also, the Board of Christian Ed would like to invite all children ages 3 through 13 to join us for our spring session of Sunday School. Um, the classes will be starting next Sunday. And now Pastor Cole has a few announcements to make. Well, good morning and happy Easter to all of you. Uh, we, uh, people don't remember what we did last Easter. But if you do remember, we had uh, a service at 7.30 in the morning with no people here. And we broadcasted that on Facebook, and we recorded it to put on WBAC at 10 o'clock. That was bizarre. So it feels like a long time since we've done Easter together. Uh, but we're glad you're here today. Um, I, I think many of you have heard by now of the uh, tragedy in our community uh, with Matthew John Phillips, a 14-year-old child that uh, was riding his bicycle and uh, uh, a uh, pre-existing heart condition uh, ended up leading to his death, and there will be a, a viewing uh, tomorrow between 4 and 7 at the uh, Chiampas uh, Funeral Home in Shrewsbury, and there will be uh, a service on, uh, at uh, St. Mary of the Hills uh, on uh, Tuesday at 11. Uh, but certainly, if nothing more, keep the family uh, in your prayers. And then uh, we had a nice little time together this morning out in the field at the sunrise service. Uh, it seemed to work out pretty well. Um, but there's some leftover coffee, and you could potentially benefit from that. Uh, so I'll have it set up uh, on the sidewalk out there. Hopefully it's still warm. I think it is. It's, it's in a container that's supposed to hold heat. So um, anyway, that's what the... Uh, you might want to stick around on this beautiful day and have a cup of coffee with some friends out in the parking lot. Thank you. And now if you can stand, if you are able, and join me in the call to worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Where, O oh grave, is your victory? Where, O oh death, death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. And now if you'll join me with the invocation. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your only begotten son into the world that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 
We thank you that you demonstrated your love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you that the grave could not hold him down, that he arose from the dead, and that he lives forevermore. May this season not pass without us pondering the real meaning of Easter, the real identity of Jesus, and the real response you are looking for from our lives. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's join our hearts together in this prayer of confession. Risen Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Forgive us when we are like your disciples before your resurrection. Forgive us for letting your teachings go in one ear and out the other. Forgive us for the times that we hide the fact that we know you. Forgive us for the times that we desert you. Fill us with faith and courage that you gave to your disciples after you showed yourself alive to them.
We rejoice in the words of the psalmist who said, Blessed is the person whose sins God has forgiven, whose sins the Lord does not count against them. When I kept silent, I felt awful, for day and night your hand was heavy on me, O Lord. But then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. We praise the Lord for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I uh, had a little trouble coming up with something creative as far as the uh, children's sermon message goes this morning, uh, but I thought it might be fun to focus on the stone that was put in front of the tomb. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So... Um, you know, this, this thing weighs a little something, but it doesn't weigh anything like the stone that was put in front of the tomb. Uh, you'll remember that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, he um, uh, solicited the body of Jesus after he had died, and Pilate was like uncertain. Pilate was like, I, I mean, uh, yeah, Pilate. Uh, he, he said, you know, is, is he really dead already? And he died earlier than most crucifixions because of the fact that he was so beaten up uh, going into his crucifixion. That's why the cross had to be carried for him and so forth. And so uh, he died early, but they usually break bones in the legs because you need the legs in order to breathe when you're hanging on a cross. And, and they broke the legs uh, of the others, but they didn't need to break Jesus's leg. But as an extra precaution, they just decided to lunge a sword through his side that went up into his heart and out came gushing of blood and water. And, uh, you know, so Pilate was convinced that Jesus was dead. Whose idea was this? And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, so Jesus was indeed truly dead. And Joseph, wanting to get the body buried before sundown, because that's when the Jewish Sabbath began on Friday night at sundown, uh, Pilate did a, a half job of uh, giving Jesus a proper burial, more concerned about getting him in the, the tomb than uh, anything else at that point. And so they got Jesus in the tomb, and uh, then they rolled the boulder in front of it. Now, any guesses on how heavy those boulders were that they rolled in front of tombs in Jesus' day? A ton times two. Yeah, that's close. That, a ton times two. Uh, so two tons. And so, you know, this, they, they had these little runners that they would run the circular stone down. They would carve it circular and run it down and go in front of the tomb. And then, uh, you know, it took a whole bunch of guys to roll it back up that little incline. Uh, and then they would roll it back. So as the women were walking to the tomb on early on Sunday morning, when they could resume work, when the Sabbath had already passed, uh, they wanted to finish the job and give Jesus a more proper burial, except that they wondered, like, who is going to move the stone for us? How are we going to get in there? How are we going to get in at his body? But when they got to the tomb, they saw that it was already rolled back. What they didn't know is that in the meantime, an angel had come, and rolled the stone back. And uh, why did the stone need to be rolled back? Um, well, a lot of us think, well, so Jesus could get out, right? Well, that would have been no problem for Jesus, you know, to get out. Uh, the problem was that how would people get in without the stone there and see is uh, that the fact that he was no longer there. But when the women finally did get to the tomb and poked their head into the tomb. The body was missing, but an angel was there to let them know that Jesus is not here. He has risen from the dead. And so I just thought I'd focus on the stone a little bit so you get some appreciation for, uh, for what, what took place there at the uh, resurrection. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Ooh. All right, are we into scripture now? Okay, let's do that. You won't need to do any upper body work today, will you? <laughs> I was going to have a kid do it, you know? <laughs> but then I thought, that would really be cruel now that I've done it, so. Our 
first scripture reading for today is from Job, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Our second scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they emptied, entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And our final reading for today is from 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 8. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So a woman was standing before a judge and uh, she was awaiting sentencing for stealing a can of peaches. The uh, judge said, how many peaches were in that can? And she said, four. And he said, I'm going to sentence you to four months in prison, one for each peach. And from the back of the courthouse came this yell from her husband saying, she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> well, on a more serious, far more serious matter, uh, this week we heard the uh, opening arguments in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis police officer accused of uh, killing uh, George Floyd. And we, we had the opening arguments, um, the prosecution saying that excessive use of force led to George Floyd's death, and the defense saying that uh, proper police protocol was followed and that there was a different cause to uh, his death. And so then following uh, opening arguments, uh, the uh, lawyers bring forth witnesses. And then they, uh, you know, hear, well, and we started hearing from the witnesses uh, this week. Uh, and then after the witnessing phase is over, there's closing arguments. And I view uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, a lot that way, is that Paul, in the, and that, that's what, some of what we just read, um, is Paul makes this opening argument for the essential nature of the resurrection of Jesus, and then he brings in his witnesses. Uh, he brings in uh, a string of witnesses and says they witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, 
And then he presents closing arguments, which is a long uh, part of the, the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, the uh, great resurrection chapter of the Bible, which I commend to the reading of people uh, every Easter Sunday. And I don't know that anybody takes me up on that, but I commend it anyway. But his opening argument is found in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, uh, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you firmly hold to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you as of utmost importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day. That's his opening argument. He's saying that uh, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. And he's saying that the resurrection of Jesus is an essential part of Christianity. And the reason he had to say that was because in the church at that time, there were these uh, heretical people. Uh, they've been later dubbed Christian Gnostics, uh, those that had elements of Christianity, but they also had elements of Gnosticism, uh, kind of all mixed together. And the Gnosticism part of them said that uh, the only thing that's important about human beings is their soul. Uh, the body of human beings is unimportant. And so what you do with your body is unimportant, uh, and uh, what you... Um, uh, and the fact that Jesus, whether he rose again from, in a body or not, doesn't matter uh, because the body is unimportant. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It does matter. There's no such thing as Christianity apart from the resurrection of Jesus. And even today, we, we, we do have Christian Gnosticism uh, in elements of the church. Uh, but maybe in another way, we have a lot of emphasis on the ethics or the morality of Christianity, where uh, Christianity is a religion where, uh, you know, all, all that matters is that we love and respect other people. And Paul says, no, 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 the resurrection also matters uh, in, in terms of Christianity. And sometimes the resurrection of Jesus is used as a metaphor uh, of uh, someone that's in dire circumstances having new life and new hope and so forth. And so there are ways that the resurrection does get denied uh, or uh, shelved in uh, churches today. And Paul's saying here that this is absolutely essential to uh, Christianity. That's his opening argument. And then he has these uh, witnesses come forth and they're listed there in your 1 Corinthians 15, one to eight passage. Uh, the first witness to come forth is the apostle Peter. Now, Peter was probably the prominent, most important person in the early church. And so he starts out with a star witness. And uh, Peter can testify to the fact that he saw Jesus alive after his death. And then it says that there were the 12, uh, which is uh, synonymous with the apostles. And uh, on the night that Jesus rose from the dead, um, that Sunday evening, he, was, he, he dropped in on uh, the hiding disciples in a meeting that they were having. Thomas wasn't present, but all the rest of them were. Of course, Judas wasn't present, but uh, the apostles were together. Jesus appears to them, and uh, they can testify. The apostles can testify to the fact that they saw Jesus alive after he was dead. And then he alludes to 500 believers who all at once uh, saw the risen Lord. And he said that most of them are still living to this day. 17 years later, when he wrote this letter, most of them are still living to this day. And they can testify to the fact that Jesus appeared to them alive after he was dead. Then he mentions his fourth witness, James. James was another prominent leader in the early church. He was like the... the lead pastor, you can say, of the mega church in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, he was an important figure in the early church. And he can testify to seeing Jesus alive from the dead. 
And then the fifth witness is the apostles again, uh, because there was that first Sunday night of his resurrection when he appeared to them, and then a week later he appears to them, this time Thomas being present. And uh, you know, in the first meeting, Thomas said, you know, I hear what you guys are saying, but unless I see the Lord for myself, I will not believe. Unless I can put my finger in the punctures in his hand, I will not believe. You know, seeing is believing, that old argument. And, uh, and, and finally, the Lord does appear uh, in this uh, second Sunday night meeting of the apostles. And Thomas falls before him and says, my Lord and my God. And so the disciples once again saw the risen Lord. And then Paul himself can say, I saw the risen Lord, the very author of the passage that we're, we're running our eyes down. And so if you were here earlier this morning, and, and most of you weren't, but we basically went through a harmonized accounting of all the people that saw Jesus after he had uh, risen. So if you put Jesus at the center of this thing, around him are these people called apostles that he selected to be eyewitnesses of his resurrection. And then you can draw another circle because there were a number of women and, and men, men and women, and people that were um, associate, closely associated with uh, the apostles who also were privileged to see the Lord. So they call that the apostolic circle, that whole circle of people that were privileged to see the risen Lord. And um, they were given the responsibility of being eyewitnesses to the resurrection and they were responsible to bear witness to the resurrection. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, the Apostle John said, This happened from the beginning of Christ's ministry, which we apostles have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. And this is what we proclaim to you concerning Jesus Christ, that he appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you that which we have seen and heard. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, the apostle Peter says, uh, we apostles did not create cleverly devised fables when we taught you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, that I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you and you're going to be endued with power. And when you are endued with power, you are going to go out and bear witness for me, uh, first of all in Jerusalem, and then in uh, Judea, and then in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, that I have, in fact, risen from the dead. And then uh, it says in Acts 4.3 that with great power, the apostles continued to bear witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Peter was speaking to uh, the Jewish leaders who had um, uh, conspired to see our Lord crucified. And um, in speaking to them, he said, you leaders of the Jew killed the author of life, but God has raised him from the dead, and we apostles are witnesses of this fact. And finally, I know I'm drowning you in scripture here, but uh, finally, Acts chapter 10, Verse uh, 39 and following says, We apostles are witnesses of everything that Jesus did. The Jewish leaders and the Romans killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by everyone, but by witnesses whom God selected, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to testify to everyone and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through him. And so the world has the eyewitness testimony of the apostolic circle to deal with. And where Christianity is known, uh, that witness of those individuals is in our face. It's something that Wow, if that's true, it's something that we really have to deal with. And you're the jury, you have to decide whether you find the witnesses to be reliable or not. 
Historians all agree that something strange happened surrounding the death of Christ. Well, that, that is all but those that like, uh, there, there's a few theorists out there that Jesus didn't even exist. Um, they're like the people that think that the Holocaust didn't happen. I mean, there's always a few, right? Um, but, uh, but basically, historians you know, all agree that something happened that the body of Jesus was missing. Now, we've heard the testimony of the uh, apostles that they saw it as a supernatural event, and those that believe their message are called Christians. But um, there's others that can't bring themselves to believe in the supernatural. Uh, they, uh, they look for naturalistic explanations. And one of the uh, explanations is that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Another one is that Jesus swooned. That is, uh, he wasn't fully dead, but he uh, kind of came back to life again in the tomb. And then he rolled the huge boulder away and showed himself alive to his disciples. And they took that to be evidence that he had resurrected. And then there's the uh, uh, idea that the women went to the wrong tomb in search of the body of Jesus. And these explanations all sound plausible upon first hearing. But upon closer examination, you know, they, they, they're, they're very faulty. They, they create more problems than they, they solve. Um, just touching on it a little bit, the disciples stole the body of Jesus. They were in no frame of mind to steal the body of Jesus. What, they, what Jesus said about the resurrection, um, before his resurrection, one in one ear and out the other. Uh, and furthermore, when he was crucified, they deserted him. They were disillusioned. They were confused. They didn't know what to do. They were not the type of people that were going to muster up the courage to cross a, uh, uh, a Roman guard and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, face the possibility of execution themselves uh, via crucifixion, which is what a what would have happened if they'd have got caught stealing the body of Jesus. Then the swoon theory is just medically impossible. Um, there, there aren't too many that disagree with that. And then the women going to the wrong tomb, well, okay, but someone could have, you know, they would have said, oh, Jesus is alive, we didn't see him in the tomb. Oh, well, you went to the wrong tomb because look, here's the right tomb and look, there's the body. And so, um, you know, but if you can't handle a supernaturalistic explanation, then you got to look for some kind of naturalistic explanation. But the eyewitness testimony of the apostles must have been quite compelling because within weeks and without months, Christianity had swelled. Uh, it wasn't like, um, you know, just a slow, gradual uh, growth. It exploded. It's what what I call a big bang, um, that uh, so many believed all at once. And in fact, uh, today there are billions of people around the world that believe, and I believe, and I hope you believe. Now, some people say that seeing is believing. I only believe what I can see for myself. And I don't think that's true of anybody, um, uh, at least not consistently. I'm sure that uh, if we did a poll, each and every one of you believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. But you don't know that because you saw George Washington. You know that because others saw George Washington and bore witness to the fact that he did this and he did that, he was alive and so forth. And so, uh, you know, we have uh, eyewitness testimony that compels us to believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And so it is with the person and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can believe in the resurrection of Christ without having seen him uh, for ourselves, without having heard him, without having touched him. Um, we can do it on the basis of eyewitness testimony. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 says, uh, it, Peter says, you know, I saw, I, I was privileged to see the resurrected Lord. And even though you have not seen him, you who I'm writing to, you love him. 
And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. And in John chapter 20, in verse 29, this is when, Peter, uh, when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, Jesus, the next thing he said was, because you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen me and have believed. There is a special blessedness that comes to those who didn't have the privilege of seeing, but believe anyway on the basis of eyewitness testimony. And so to quote the words of the uh, Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day he arose again from the dead. And I hope that expresses your faith as well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. Lord, open up our eyes to the reality of your resurrection. May the reality of your resurrection and the reality of your identity of who you are, may it absolutely transform our lives. May we fall before you and say, my Lord and my God. May we give our lives fully to you, knowing that it is you who created us for your purposes and that we don't have the right to just live for any old purpose that we decide for ourselves. May your resurrection fill us with inexpressible and glorious joy and continue to use us as witnesses in the world until the whole world has heard the witness of your apostles that Jesus is alive, and in his name we pray, amen. Well, it looks like the Lord has given us a wonderful day, and I hope it is a wonderful day for you, getting together with family or whatever you're doing, but don't forget the resurrected Lord. That's the reason for the day, uh, is to remember the glorious day that he arose again from the dead. Now may God, who uh, brought our Lord Jesus Christ back from the dead, equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen.